Question 19. Two masses, M1 and M2, are connected by a massless, non-extensible string supported by a massless pulley attached to a table with a hole in the middle. Assuming no friction, derive an expression for the acceleration of the masses and for the tension of the string. This is quite a common style of question in PAT exams. The easiest way to approach it is to take the two masses as separate systems. So let's sketch system one. We have mass M1 being pulled across the desk by a tension force. And it is accelerating in that direction. The net force causing that acceleration is equal to M1A. And that is all coming from the tension in the rope. So the tension here is equal to M1 multiplied by acceleration. Mass 2. We have its weight acting down, so that's M2 multiplied by G, and we have a tension acting up through the rope. And it is again accelerating downwards, we'll assume. So that net force, M2A, is going to be equal to m2g take away the tension that is acting in the opposite direction. If we rearrange that to make t the subject, we'll have t equals m2g take away m2a. Now we can equate equations 1 and 2 to get m1a equals m2g minus m2a. Let's group the a's together on one side. So m1a plus m2a equals m2g. If we factorise and rearrange, that will give us a equals m2g divided by m1 plus m2. If we want here we could get rid of g and replace that with 10. Uh, I'm going to leave it as g. Now that is our equation for the acceleration. We also need to find an expression for t. We know that t equals m1a so let's substitute a into that and it will give us t equals m1 multiplied by m2 g divided by m1 plus m2. Part b, derive expressions for the acceleration of the masses and for the tension of the string, what conditions need to be satisfied for m1 to accelerate? So again, we'll go through the same exercise as we did previously but this time considering friction. So we have our first block, M1, and there is a tension acting that way. It's an acceleration in that direction as well, we'll assume. But now there is also a force acting backwards, which is the force due to friction. So again, we can say that the acceleration, the net force M1A is equal to the tension, but this time we must also take away from it the frictional force F, FR, which is equal to mu mg. It doesn't matter too much whether we use mu S for static friction or mu D here, they're different values, but they're uh, both related to mg in the same way. And for our second situation, we have m2 with m2g 
g acting down, acceleration due to gravity, and tension acting up. So the friction does not affect m2, so m2a is the same as it was before, m2a equals m2g minus t, although evidently that t is now going to be different. So put in equation 1 in terms of t, we get t equals m1a plus mu mg, should be m1 there and m1 there, so we're clear about which mass we're talking about, which we can simplify to m1a plus mu g. Now let's substitute that into equation 2 to give us m2a equals m2g minus m1 multiplied by a plus mu g. So if we expand that out and group our a terms on one side, that will give us m2a plus m1a is equal to m2g minus m1 mu g. And again, factorising, so a is m2 plus m1 equals m2g take away m1 mu g. Finally, we get an expression for a, which is a equals m 2g minus m1 mu g divided by m2 plus m1. And we can also factorise g there. So g brackets m2 take away m1 mu divided by m2 plus m1 gives us our acceleration. Let's begin by taking equation 2, because that's a slightly simpler equation, and putting it in terms of t. So t equals m2g minus m2a, and then we can substitute our a in, in, into here, so we get m2g minus m2g times m2 minus m1 mu divided by m2 plus m1. And if we factorise, we'll end up with t equals m2g multiplied by 1 minus m2 minus m1 mu divided by m2 plus m1. Now the question also asks us what conditions need to be satisfied for m1 to accelerate. In order to get an acceleration, we need to look at this term here. For a positive acceleration, we must have a positive value here. So m2 must be greater than m1 multiplied by mu. Under those circumstances, this term will be a positive value and therefore the block will accelerate. Note that the mu here must be mu s, that is the static coefficient of friction, because the block is not yet moving. Part C introduces some uh, circular motion to the question. The table on which the mass is resting is now rotating about the vertical axis going through the middle of the table with angular speed omega. Assuming that the object with mass m1 can be treated as point-like, derive expressions for the minimal r min and maximal r max distance between m1 and the axis of rotation such that when r is between those values m1 will not be moving radially. So let's look at it from the top now. You have your mass m1 
still with a tension force acting inwards, but it is now rotating around, or rather the table it's sitting on is rotating around. So that's our tension force, that's omega, and we have a frictional force mu m1 g. Now if the block is not accelerating, we know that the we know that m2 has a, a weight m2g and the tension acting up. If there's no acceleration, then T is equal to m2g. Let's think about this problem under two circumstances. If the tension is providing too great a centripetal force, then the mass will accelerate inwards. And that would be because this frictional force is not great enough. So this is case one. There is also a second case. Again, we have the mass, m1, rotating with omega. And we have a tension force, T, acting inwards. Now, if this T is not large enough to provide the required centripetal force, then the block will accelerate radially outwards. And what's going to oppose that would be the friction mu m1 g, this time acting inwards. So, so this is why there is a range of values that will allow the block not to, not to move. If there was no friction, there would be one perfect radius. But because there's friction, there is a range of values because the friction can work to our benefit in both directions, depending on which way the block is inclined to move. So let's take a look at case one. For the block not to move, the centripetal force provided by T take away mu m1g must be equal to m v squared over r, which can also be written, so m1, which can also be written as m1 omega squared r, because v equals omega r, and t is equal to m2g, so m2g take away mu m1g is equal to m1 omega squared r. So let's rearrange to find r. So r equals m2g take away mu m1g divided by m1 omega squared. So that is our equation for r min, the minimum radius allowable. And if we take a look at case two, the only difference is that the tension and the friction and force are acting in the same direction. So we now have an equation T plus mu m1g equals m1v squared over r. And we could follow all this through, but the end result is going to be that r max is equal to m2g plus, so that's the only difference there, plus mu m1g over m1 omega squared. Again, if we want, we can factorise out those g's.